Hey friends, welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. And today's topic is about play. So this is a topic that I kind of unintentionally became interested in um, as my own children started to grow. And I would post pictures of some of their homestead escapades online. And to me, a lot of the things they were doing felt pretty run of the mill and normal, you know, floating boats in ponds and jumping off the hay bales and, you know, uh, balancing on fences and things like that. But I noticed something funny every time I'd post them uh, on social media. And that was that those simple play photos got a lot of attention. And people kept saying things like, man, I don't see kids play anymore. Or I remember doing that when I was little, but my grandkids don't do that. Or I wish that more children still did those things. And it caught me off guard because I kind of thought that kids were still doing those things. But as I've become more aware, I've realized it's not as normal as it used to be. So I've been trying to kind of dig into this idea of where did play go? What's happening to play? How is it changing? And I have a wonderful expert on with me today. Welcome, Miss Susan Lynn. Hi, thanks, Jill. I'm so happy to be talking with you. And how great that your children do those things. Yes, it's it's fun to watch. And yeah, it, it just feels um, like it's good for more more than just the simple reason that they're getting outside and, um, you know, not running through the house screaming and yelling. <laughs> so it's, it's a good <laughs> That's thing. That's always good, though. Yes. So I, I came across you initially. Um, it was just a chance encounter on Instagram. I think someone had done a different podcast interview with you and had mm-hmm. posted a little clip of you talking about... Um, middle childhood and how we're kind of missing middle childhood. And I watched that over and over because I was like, oh my goodness, I had wondered about that, but I hadn't heard anyone speak to it. So do you mind if we just kind of dive in there and then see where that takes us? Sure. Okay. Am I, Um, am I diving first or are you diving? Yeah, no, if you could just explain a little bit, what is middle childhood and what are you seeing that's changing in our modern culture around that time of life? Okay. So basically, when we think about childhood and child development, we think about stages. So there's, you know, infancy, toddlers, preschoolers, and then, you know, starting around, you know, six or or, or seven to, you know, 10, 11, maybe 12. These days, you have what we call middle childhood, and then there's adolescence. But um, middle childhood has been kind of co-opted by advertisers and marketers. Um, In fact, it's not called middle childhood anymore. They're tweens, which means, you know, not, you know, they're not little kids and they're not teenagers. They're tweens. But tweens, it's a good marketing term because it kind of sounds like teens, you know, and teenagers. But it's not great for kids to be thought of as just little tiny adolescents. And, um, and so what happens is that, that um, when kids are immersed in commercialism, as so many children are today, they, um, what, what they get is bombarded with messages about what they're supposed to be like. And marketers, they have something that's called um, kids getting older, younger, and even they call it KGOI, kids getting older, younger. And so the idea is that, um, that it's based on, I'm sorry, it's based on this, you know, child development principle. And what we've all observed that children look up to older kids and they want to be like them. But what the marketing industry does is say, well, if preschoolers want to be like 12-year-olds, let's market products that we would ordinarily market to 12-year-olds. And if seven-year-olds want to be like 16-year-olds, let's market to them as if they were 16-year-olds. And so what happens is that children often get like all the trappings of adolescence, but they don't have the maturity to know how to handle them. So, you know, boys are marketed and and it is gendered still. So boys are marketed really, you know, horribly violent films and television programs and things like that. And girls are marketed, they're marketed sex, but it's not real sex or it's not relational sex. It's 
it's sex as commodity. So that it, you know, we call it sexualization. And one thing, you know, that's terribly concerning is the sexualization of little girls. Middle childhood used to be and should be a very important time for girls because it's when they have um, all of their basic skills. You know, they can run and skip and hop and jump and, you know, they're getting more control over their bodies. They, you know, they can, you know, usually at least rudimentarily read and write. Um, and, and so they've got the building blocks and it, and it should be a time when they really flower, when they explore, you know, different intellectual pursuits, different physical pursuits. I mean, the whole world sort of opens up for them. But what they're getting instead is the notion that they should be thinking about their bodies. They should be worried about being too fat. They should be worried about not being pretty enough, pretty enough, or or even sexy enough. You know, but they don't have the emotional maturity to deal with all that. So, um, so it 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 troubles me and it saddens me that girls are missing out on that very crucial time in their lives. Absolutely. Um, and that's, yeah, the reason your other interview caught my attention so quickly is because, so I have a 12 year old daughter and we're, we homeschool and we also live in a homestead. So she has friends, but she's not in a peer group, you know, day in and day out. So we, we just kind of march by the beat of our own drum a little bit. Uh -huh. And so she plays, she has two younger siblings and she's very responsible, but she still plays. You know, she rides bikes and she still does some pretending and a lot of she play with some of the toys still and does all of that. Um, but then when I notice when we're in her peer groups in different settings, the girls her age, it feels like they left the toys behind or the playing or the make believe line behind years ago. And it kind of caught me off guard. And I'm like, um, I, I guess I was trying to figure out, is it developmentally normal for a child in that middle childhood range to still be playing or is it where, where should, well, how do I phrase this? I don't, I hate to use the word normal because normal is a loaded word. Yeah. I was what's, thinking, yes. Yeah. What's healthy for a, for a child in that age range is play still beneficial to them. You know, um, first of all, I, you know, all, all children are different. They develop differently. Um, they have different strengths. They have different weaknesses, you know, so it really depends on, on your child. But play is beneficial, you know, for any age. I mean, it never stops being beneficial. It's, be it's beneficial for adults. And so what we don't want is to encourage kids to put that behind or to get the message that playing is babyish, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when I think about play, I mean, there's, it's not like, organized sports, which, you know, you know, lots of kids really enjoy and have some benefits for kids. And that could be play, but it can't be play if what they're, the main focus is on winning. What's so wonderful about play, or one of the many things, is that what's important is the process. When you're playing, what you're doing is more important than the result that you're going to get, which is interesting because Play, you know, leads to all kinds of scientific discoveries and great art, great music all has its roots in, in, in beginning with play, in beginning with creative play. So from your perspective, do you see the marketers, the, the Kegoi concept, is, I've never heard that before, that's fascinating. Um, is it that they're just marketing these ideas that are older and that's drawing the kids away from play? Or is there this, are they kind of marketing the idea that play isn't cool? You know, there are, I think there are two different issues that are kind of converging. One is um, it's not just ideas. It's also products, sexualized clothing, mm -hmm. you know, makeup, or, you know, makeup kits, um, fashion dolls that are highly sexualized, um, like the Bratz or the Monster High dolls, you know, or, you know, the old standby Barbie. Um, so so that that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is that we as a society really 
seem to be doing everything we can to discourage kids from playing, starting when they're babies. Because um, what, what play, play, creative play is like the intersection of your inner world with the outer world. It's when you bring ideas or thoughts or feelings or visions, um, not hallucinations, but you know, just imagination. When you bring that out into the actual world, and then you do something with it. So, so play is neither, it's, it's neither real nor unreal. It's kind of like a combination of both simultaneously, because when you play, like if you're playing, um, a, a terrible dragon is coming after somebody, the dragon isn't really coming after whoever it is. You're, you're pretending that it is, but you're really expending energy making that happen. Something is happening, you know, in real life. So, but, but in order for that to happen, kids need, they need things that they're not getting. They need silence. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the problems with the toys that are marketed starting when kids are babies is that they just make so much noise. You know, the toys all, they talk, they chirp, they beep. So, so, you know, for, for one thing that's, you know, or the apps that kids play with, you know, the most of them, there's music or, or sounds that go along with it. And, and those are um, invasive and distracting, you know, for kids. So they need silence, they need inspiration, they need time and, and, and they need opportunities to, to generate and to act rather than react. And one of the problems with all of, you know, the, with the best, most, not all, but, you know, many of the best selling toys is that the toys do so much that there's nothing really left for the kids to do, you know, and then the toys that really encourage creative play, um, stuffed animals that don't have voices and don't move on their own or um, or dolls or art supplies or bill or blocks or trucks and cars that that don't move on their own but that you move yourself um, those are kind of called you know they're dismissed as being old-fashioned and and you know retro and not not modern and not forward-looking but really it's those toys and, and you know, being, having opportunities to play outside, to play in nature or, or, you know, just, you know, to be outside and to organize games, you know, with your friends. Those are the building blocks that kids need for the, for the future. Hmm. Uh, they, you know, when, when you play, you, you, um, you get to exercise your imagination. You get, the experience of initiating something and following it through, which, you know, what educators might call executive function. You know, you, if you're playing with other people and other kids, you learn cooperation and, and negotiation. I mean, the, the, those skills are so important for children and they're available, you know, to all kids, at least all neurotypical kids. You know, so, um, but, but what happens is that marketing, you know, um, you, today, of course, it's not just television, but, you know, through apps and through tablets and phones, there's so much, you know, advertising that, um, that parents and kids are being told, this is what's fun. This is what's educational. When, you know, really often it isn't. I hope I'm not going on too much. No, I, I love it. No, no, this is oh, great. Good. Keep I, going. You know, <laughs> I'm talking about something I really care about. So no, I, 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 I love it. No, please do okay. not do not uh, taper it down. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you you mentioned a minute ago that society or culture or whatever is basically discouraging play from infanthood, and is that just do you see that happening basically like that combination of marketing? 
the noisy toys that are doing all the things with the buttons. And then our, sometimes as parents, we have an affinity towards technology because it makes our lives easier, at least at first. So do you see that, is that kind of the convergence of factors or is there other pieces at play there? I think it, it's a convergence of, of, of factors. And one of the things that that I, you know, I've written about is that basically what we're dealing is with, you know, and have been, you know, since the early 2000s, really, with the convergence of um, of incredibly powerful technologies and um, and this love affair that we have in the United States with deregulation which basically allows corporations to pretty much market to kids any way that they want. There just aren't a lot of laws protecting children in the market, in the marketplace. So that combination, the technology and the marketing is, I think has been really harmful for many, many, many children. I imagine you've seen an uptick in, in all of this with the advent of, of smartphones and tablets. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it just it skyrocketed versus, I mean, I'm sure it was in play with just television, but that couldn't have been as impactful as the, the phones in our hands, it, right? And yet it was pretty impactful. Was it? I mean, that's the thing that, it, you know, as somebody who's been, I mean, I've been Im- immersed in, um, in, in looking at and trying to do something about the commercialization of childhood since, um, wow, for the past 22 years. And I was concerned about it before that. And, and you know, 22 years ago, all there was pretty much was television and videos. And then slowly, um, you know, there was slowly the new technologies were becoming more and more and more popular. But even, you know, television... In and, in and of itself. I mean, we look, may look back at it nostalgically, but it was a problem. And, and kids were spending huge amounts of time watching television. In fact, a study of kids around, around the world, um, the, the activity that they were, were engaged in most was watching television. Hmm. Okay. Not play, not creative play, not what they would otherwise be doing. Yes. So, te- yes. So, it, but you're right. The new technologies are even more, um, are even more compelling. Yeah. They, I mean, and they really, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, they're designed to be addictive. That's the business model for the people making, um, you know, apps for smartphones or, you know, the smartphones themselves. What's on them is, is designed to be addictive. It's, and and, and they're, de- they're designed, you know, specifically to sell things to people. That's what they're for. You know, along the way, you know, there, there are positive things that can come from them. I mean, certainly, you know, during COVID video chatting was a lifesaver for, you know, for adults and children, you know, for sure. Or being able to go to school, you know, for kids who couldn't, you know, couldn't go to school or who won't, weren't being homeschooled. So it's not, um, I'm not anti-technology, you know, I mean, I tweet, I post, I, I'm as addicted you know, to my phone as anybody else, but, um, but it's, it's a problem. It's a problem when adults are on technology a lot in front of kids, because we model how to be a person in the world. That's a problem. And it's a problem when kids are, um, are immersed in it. And the thing about, um, about it, the new technologies, they're so compelling. I mean, it is really hard to pull yourself away from it. And one of the things um, in, I I have a book coming out that's called Who's Raising the Kids? Mm. Big Tech, Big Business and the Lives of Children. And and it has recommendations for parents about coping with this digitized digitized commercialized culture. And one of the things that I suggest is that, that, that you, when you're with your kids, you wear a dumb watch. You wear a watch 
And it should not be a smartwatch. It should be a watch that just tells time. Because what I noticed when I got my smartphone, I stopped wearing my watch because I didn't need it anymore because I could tell time on my phone. But every time I looked at the time on my phone, I would check my email. I would, you know, I would start scrolling, you know, I mean, and eventually, you know, I put, <laughs> I put on yep. the watch. Yeah. When I want to know what time it is, I look at my watch and it's just, it's things like that because, because the phones have everything once, you know, you're always looking at them. And once you do, you're just lured into doing other things and kids, yeah. you know, kids yeah. do the same way. I know I've totally been guilty of that. Um, it's almost like it, of you, you shut your brain off, you open the phone to check the weather and then 20 minutes later, you're like, where am I? And what am I doing? And I don't even know why I'm looking at this. So yeah, it's, you know, we're, I, you know, we're all, I, I know very few people who are able to resist that. Yeah. So what so don't feel bad. Yeah, is what I'm no, saying. I know we're all I feel like we're all in the same boat. And I do know a few people who have completely yeah. ditched uh, a smartphone, which I totally yeah. admire. I just haven't been able to finagle yeah. out with business and all in work and all that. But it's admirable. Well, Maybe I still have mine. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've heard people talk about um, how sometimes and I don't remember all the science, but how the constant checking of technology and the constant hits of dopamine that we get from social media, how it kind of almost rewires our brain in a sense, even as adults. And I'm assuming so much more so with children because they're developing mm -hmm. as they're consuming all of this. Um, right. What What would your advice be for a parent who has a child that they maybe done a lot of technology up to this point, they're listening to this and they're like, man, I want to reverse this, but the kid got that addiction going on. How do you recommend helping that child make other choices on how to spend their time? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one thing is that less is more. I mean, do less. I mean, if, you know, I think, um, you know, take an honest look about how much you and your family are, are hooked on, on screens and screen technologies and then, and, and, and cut back on it. Um, try to carve out times in your family where there are no screens. I mean, some people do screen-free meals. And I, I think that's actually really important. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it used to be, you know, people would have the television on while they ate. But, you know, just don't bring your phones to the table. I mean, that that's actually pretty easy. And that's important because it's a way for the family, you know, if you're, if you do family dinners, if, if, you know, you're in a family situation where you can do that, that's a time for family bonding and to tell jokes or to be silly or to find out how everybody's day went. And it, it gives kids pra a practice with conversation, you know, so I think that there are, are, are little things that you can do. And then of course, there's Screen Free Week, which takes place um, in May, and you can find that website at screenfree.org. You can find about that, and that has lots of suggestions. And that's also um, a time when whole communities come together and people sign pledges, you know, to spend a week not using screens except for work and homework. So, um, and that way, you can find other people going through it and it helps to have support, mm -hmm, definitely. I think. And, and also what, what people report, people who do screen free week or who start cutting back or cutting it out is that the first few days are hard and then it gets easier. And then, you know, the kids find things to do and they find things to do that, you know, are, creative and interesting, but they need the time. And I'm not saying it's going to be a breeze, you know, to start out with, you know, it may not be. And, and a lot depends on how old your kids are as well. I mean, if yeah. you, you know, if your kids are really young, it's easier because they're more malleable. For sure. I feel like, I feel like sometimes there's a withdrawal period. You almost have yeah. to get the tech out right. of your system and then it gets 
a little better as we go, as we go along. But the first few days were rough. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think it, it gets a lot a lot better. And one thing that I think that people, you know, need to remember is that, which you which you said earlier. I mean, children's brains are growing and developing. And everything that they do and things that they don't do really affects the actual architecture of their brain. So, you know, if, if your child is spending hours a day with the screen, say your, your four-year-old or your five-year-old, your three-year-old, then, you know, their brain is being wired to make, you know, so that they really need that. And, and you know, that's a problem. And, and I, I also think it's important um, to remember that in, in some ways, it's never been harder to be a parent than it is today mm-hmm. because you have this, you know, this zillion dollar multinational industry working day and night to undermine parents and, you know, to target kids with messages that are basically irresistible. So, you know, if you're a parent and you're having a hard time with this, it's not surprising. And, you know, I'm not here and I didn't start doing this work to make people feel guilty. I mean, I, I, I just think it's extremely difficult to be a parent today because, because the culture is really problematic. This episode is sponsored by Redmond Agriculture. If you recall from previous episodes, they're the company that produces my absolute favorite salt for baking and cooking. And they just launched something new that I have been dying to tell you about. So for years, you've heard me talk about soil testing. And it's so crucial for us as home gardeners who are trying to produce food to know what's going on at the soil level. Otherwise, it's really easy to get frustrated and not understand why your yields might be where you need them to be, why some plants are struggling, and so on. Now, the problem with soil tests is that they've been pretty cumbersome to do. You have to find a university that does it locally or mail them off to random places online. It just hasn't been a great option until now. So Redmond's just launched a soil test kit that is designed for people like you and me, homesteaders and home gardeners. And what I'm holding here is a bunch of my printout results, and I have been totally nerding out over this. So it's super easy to do. Uh, You get the kit, you send it in in the mail, and within five or six days, you'll have results emailed to you. I discovered things in my test reports that I had no idea. Uh, I'm going to go into all the nitty gritty on a future podcast episode, but um, just for now, I'll tell you a few of the most surprising findings. I discovered my compost pile was low in nitrogen. I discovered my greenhouse was too high in nitrogen, and I discovered why the potting soil that had gave me so much trouble this spring was killing all my plants. So again, I'll go into the details in an up, uh, upcoming episode. But for now, I want you to have access to the soil kit because gardening season is rapidly coming to a close. And if you've had a rough year, like many folks are reporting that they've had, um, now is the time to test your soil and figure out what's up. So if you go over to the prairiehomestead.com slash soil test, you can use the code homestead to save 15% on soil kits or anything else that Redmond's has to offer. So I can't wait for you to try this. Um, Knowledge is power. And as gardeners, we can use all of the data that we can get. So now back to our episode. Absolutely. Just just because I'm curious, I love history and figuring out when things started. When when did the commercialization of childhood really kick in? I mean, I know smartphones are more recent, but did this happen? Like, I I noticed a lot of that happened in the 40s and 50s. Was that kind of when this came to pass or was it before or after? You know, the, you know, the 40s, and I mean, there was always some, you know, a little bit. I mean, television in the 1950s was filled with all kinds of commercials, but there wasn't that much on. And there were only basically three or maybe four channels for people to watch. So it it, it wasn't the same. But really, it was the 1980s. Okay. In, in 1978, the Federal Trade Commission proposed... Um, ending all marketing to children under eight on television and um, ending junk food marketing to kids under 12. And they were going to do that, but there was so much pressure on Congress from the sugar industry and the toy industry and the junk food industry, you know, and to say nothing of the television and, and, you know, the media industry as well, 
that Congress actually defunded the FTC for a while, the Federal Trade Commission, and made it harder for them to regulate marketing to kids. And then in 2004, no, no, I'm sorry, in 1984, when Ronald Reagan was president, um, the Federal Communications Commission deregulated children's television and, and it became okay to create a program for the sole purpose of selling toys. Oh, and that's when you got, so it was really the 1980s. That's when it yeah. began to escalate. And then as, as, the, as the technology got increasingly sophisticated and, um, and miniaturized and seductive, all of a sudden it wasn't that kids were just sitting in front of a television, they were taking it with them. You yeah. know, portable yeah. DVD players, and now of course, you know, the tablets and phones. I mean, you can take them everywhere with you and, and or wearable technology, you know. So, um, so it began in the 1980s, it, you know, continued to escalate and, you know, here we are today. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, and I, I'm a child of the 80s, so I definitely remember just the commercials and the ads and it, yeah, I didn't realize it was oh, so yeah. new what at that you, point, but yeah. What, what do you remember? Um, I just remember the, the commercials for toys and things that were felt very exciting. And I, I even though I didn't know anything oh, yeah. about it, but I could still sense a newness and an excitement of just like, oh, we're doing kids, like, you know, the cereals and the, the skateboards and all that. I just was like, oh, this seems like yeah. it's, it's kind of a new, a new thing that they're really enjoying being able to push this out there. So, yeah. Right. Okay. And the commercials, which also seem so old fashioned now, but you know, yeah. they were you know, 30 seconds of beautiful children having the, the most wonderful time you could ever imagine Yes. with, you know, basically a toy that really isn't very much fun at all no. because it does everything for you. But we wanted it because for you obvious desperately, reasons, desperately right. wanted it. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, I mean, marketers work with psychologists and yeah. people who market to children, I'm embarrassed to say, work with child psychologists. Sure. You know, they, they, they do a lot of research. They know what children's vulnerabilities are. And so, so the advertising, you know, even on television was exquisitely designed. What makes it even more problematic today is with, uh, with the new technologies, with smartphones um, and tablets, um, they, it's, it, they know so much about us because you know they can follow us all online they know about our online activities and they can target advertising to us yeah. that is geared specifically to our vulnerabilities and to our children's vulnerabilities yes yeah and they're good at it it's i mean i've heard everyone i talk to is always like i i said this thing and now i'm getting ads for it and everyone just minds are blown and i'm like i have a feeling this is just the beginning of of right. how much more advanced they can get so yeah it's hard to resist um, I think that's right. Yeah. So I, I have had this this question. I've been just kind of chewing on it for a while, and I'm curious if if you have any thoughts around this. So, in in my observations, as we've talked about, um, you know, marketing and culture is pushing our kids to to grow up faster. But then on the other hand, I hear a lot of people talk about, and I've even experienced just in people around me. It seems like there's also this discussion about kind of the failure to launch of the the teens and the, the young 20 year olds where they're not ready to be out in the world and they're not ready to drive a car and they don't really want to leave home and i'm like i wonder if there's a connection is there something missing when we caught we force them to grow up too soon and they're not playing and they're not developing that causes them to not be ready to enter the world as an adult or am i just imagining that yeah are you familiar with lenora skenazy and and the yeah. let grow movement well we had her on the podcast a few episodes I love ago Lenore. Yeah. Delightful. Yes. She's wonderful. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, we, um, at the same time that we give kids, you know, the trappings of adolescence, we infantilize them as well, yeah. you know, and, and, and part of that is a marketing problem. Also we're marketed fear, you know, yeah. I mean, yes. We're, mar we're marketed fear. I mean, 
if a child is kidnapped, like a stranger kidnapping, and most kidnappings are not stranger kidnappings, it's all over the news all the time. And, you know, and so it seems like things are much worse than they used to be. But um, I haven't looked recently, but, but, you know, my understanding is that rates of stranger kidnapping have, have not increased right. over the, you know, the past decades. Yeah. So, so, um, so, you know, we're marketed fear and, and I think, you know, we're also marketed, you know, a, what successful means, mm. you know, the most important thing, you know, in, in some families is, you know, to get into college, not all families, you know, but some families. And so, so then, you know, the kids are in a situation where grades are more important than anything else. And, and so, you know, they're, they're not, they're not learning to love learning or to be excited about what's, what's happening, you know, in the world, they're learning for some kind of external motivation, which is, you know, a good grade or, um, you know, ultimately, you know, getting into a fantastic college, you know, or something like that. So, um, so I, I, that is a problem. I mean, we're kind of, it, I mean, your questions are kind of dealing with sort of not just, you know, one issues, but a lot of sure. issues, There's, but yeah, they're not unrelated, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I just, I found it, I just found it interesting. I I opened up a discussion on my Instagram um, around this a, a couple months ago, and I was just sharing that, so I played well into like 13, 14 year old age group. Like, I mean, not like ch super childish, but I was still kind of pretending and kind of doing some different things with model horses and toys and things like that, that I was interested in. But when I turned 18, I moved to a community college 1200 miles away and I was living on my own and I was responsible and showing up to class on time. And it felt very normal for me to progress down that road. And I know all kids are different again, so it's not to compare or to contrast, but when I think about it, it's crazy that basically four years prior to that, I was still playing with plastic horses. And then all of a sudden, not that so wonderful. Yeah. But then not much that, you know, not that much farther down the road, I was living on my own, but I'm like, it's almost like the, I'm glad my parents allowed me those years of play because it felt like it did set me up to be responsible and ready to go when adulthood came knocking. So mm -hmm. again, kids are different. I don't expect everyone to follow in the same path, but I just thought that was an interesting correlation. And some of my audience also said I was the same way. I played hard in my, you know, early teenage years, but then I was ready to roll later. So and it's an interesting thought, at least. And one of the things about about being able to play and play on your own is that you get a sense of competence. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it's competence that's not based on rewards. Yep. And, um, and, and that's an, another problem with so many of the games and activities that kids are engaged with on devices is that they're all built around rewards, you know, and, and the problem with, with doing something for a reward is that doing that thing becomes less interesting when there's no reward. And so kids are being trained to expect that, you know, they get rewards for everything and the, that the only reason to do something is for what you're going to get at the end, not what you're going to achieve yeah not for the satisfaction of what you're doing, but for, you know, the points or the level, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So that's also, you know, concerning. Definitely. And it, it kind of reminds me, I think when, when Lenore was on, she, we talked about the difference of playing organized sports versus playing a game of kickball in the backyard and how not the organized sports are bad, but it's just a different experience for the child because kickball is about all the interactions and, the picking of the teams and working together in collaboration, whereas the organized sports are, there's still good things that happen, but it's more towards the winning or the points or the, the scoring. And it's almost what you're saying. It's, it's related to the, the video game a little bit as well, where the goal of a video game is to get this, the level up or the points and the scoring. And it seems like our culture is just really fascinated with those avenues versus the journey to get somewhere. So I think th there's some interesting ties there. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to all care about the journey. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And that starts in childhood. It can start in childhood. Yeah. Well, we're, we're rolling up on our time and I know you have a lot going on, so I don't want to keep you too wow. long, but as I know we went fast, this it is fast. so fast. Um, but before we leave, we talked a little bit about helping our kids come off of technology, but do you have any last bits of advice or encouragement for parents just to help them create environments for healthy play in their home? Um, first of all, you try not to feel guilty or that you're a bad parent because that's really destructive. Um, and, and try, I think what I said earlier, whatever, you know, do less, try, you know, you, yeah. you don't have to throw away everything, but start out by trying to do less and carve out time sometime during the day, during the week, that is device-free, not just for your children, but also for you if you have a partner, for you and your partner as well, so that the whole family is, is spends some time um, device-free and, and try to think of things that, that you can enjoy together that don't involve technology. I mean, families who like to be outdoors, you know, take hikes, garden, you know, play. If, if, if you like sports, play family sports together, board games, card games, all, all of that kind of thing, um, you know, can be really fun and bring your family together. And what you want is for, for children starting, especially when they're very young, it, to, um, to help them understand that the world outside of a screen is, is you know, an, a, an interesting and fascinating place and that they can have a lot of fun and good times exploring it. Amen. Yeah. Modeling, I think, is so key there. <laughs> when you get excited, then the kids get excited. Not, maybe not at first, but eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it takes some Right. Work. Eventually. Yeah. yeah, eventually. So, excellent. Yes. Okay, so we know your new book's coming out um, soon. And actually, by the time this podcast publishes, it'll probably be right around that same time frame. So, everybody, check out Susan's new book or soon-to-be up upcoming book. It's called Big Tech, Big Business, and the Lives of Children. And then it's, you also have... Wait, actually, wait, wait. Oh, wait, did I say it wrong? It's called, sorry. Yeah, it's called Who is okay. Raising the Kids? <gasps> The oh. subtitle is Big Tech, Big Business, oh. and the Lives of Children. Thank you for clarifying. Who's raising? And you said yeah, that. Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> okay. That's a great title. Um, and then your other two are Consuming Kids and The Case for Make Believe. Are those your other two books? If people want to check those out. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm excited to dive into all of those. And where can folks find okay. you? Do you have any on online um, platforms if people want to follow you? Or are you yes. Online? Yes. My website is SusanLynn.net. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I don't use it all that much, but I'm there if you need to reach me. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Susan. This was so good and so informative and I hope it was inspiring. I know it was inspiring for our audience. It was inspiring for me. So I appreciate your time. It was really and great to talk to you. Yeah. Thank it you was so really much. fun. Thanks so much.